Welcome everyone to another of our weekly investment manager videos and many thanks once again for tuning in. One of the most enigmatic and possibly overlooked sectors in the global economy is Japan. And yet the opportunities within the land of the rising sun are potentially huge, especially within the smaller company space. Well, today I have the huge pleasure in discussing these opportunities with Carl Vine, manager of the M&G Japan Smaller Companies Fund, whose rather innovative approach to fund management has delivered an envious track record to investors. But first, before we get into the content, if you're enjoying this and other videos that we host, it would be wonderful if you could subscribe. This really does assist us in delivering our financial planning and investment content to a wider audience, and you would genuinely be helping us all on the channel. So on to the content. And once again, Carl, many thanks for your time. Um, many investors, thanks for having me. No, no problem at all. Many investors are underinvested in Japanese equities and certainly within in small cap Japanese equities. Can you possibly outline mm. the opportunity within this allocation as you see it today? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so if we start with Japanese equities as a whole, then maybe we can talk about the small caps within that. Yeah. Um, I think the starting point when talking about Japanese equities, at least for me, is they're cheap. OK, um, it's always a good place to start. Uh, I think they are cheap. Um, small caps, large caps versus cash, versus bonds, um, cheap versus their history, uh, but very cheap when you consider the, the hidden value on the balance sheets. However, in the last, my entire career, in fact, 25 years of looking at Japanese equities, there's always been some clever clogs trying to, to sell Japanese equities and asset class based on the fact that they're cheap. And that always hasn't delivered good results. So on top of the fact that we've got this useful starting point of valuation, there's actually something a lot more exciting going on today, I think. So as I said, in that 25 year period of, of looking at Japan, um, it's always been kind of an idea of opportunity, right? That, that there's been, we've heard stories of Japanese restructuring and it's often disappointed. Um, it, it, it's sort of a well-trodden um, investment narrative, but the change that I'm seeing today, honestly, is extraordinary. I think we are talking about um, a, a once in a generation shift in, in corporate behavior, in government attitudes, in, in the way that the economy actually is, is working. And you see that reflected in the rising share of profits to, to GDP. Mm -hmm. um, where's this come from? I think um, I will get to the small caps, don't worry. I, I, I think it all starts with Arbonomics. Okay, so think back 2013, 2014, big buzzword at the time. Everyone got really excited. Everyone bought a bunch of Japanese equities and then they ran away two years later because nothing had happened. Well, the reality is that the, the, type, the ambition of that program, the, the shift in um, economic model that was implied was always going to take a long time. Yeah. So here we are seven or eight years later and the rubber is meeting the road. Um, the, 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 the shift in behavior that was started um, by Arbonomics that has been encouraged by this multifaceted, um, coordinated government and, and bureaucratic drive to increase returns on investor capital is really happening. Mm -hmm. It's palpable. You, you know, we, we've been talking to companies, some companies we've been talking to consistently every quarter for nearly 25 years. Mm -hmm. And it's night and day what they're saying now, what they're doing, how they're thinking. Um, so I think that the, yes, Japanese equities are cheap. They're still cheap. Um, but companies are really doing something about that. So I think that we are in the early innings of this enormous improvement, self-improvement drive, if you will, mm -hmm. in the corporate sector. So it's about releasing value that's trapped in balance sheets, but it's also about releasing value in under-optimized commercial strategies. So there's just so many levers that, that are in the process of being pulled to deliver what I think will end up being superior earnings growth for Japan, versus most markets in the coming five to seven years, mm -hmm. um, which actually has already been delivered in the last five. If you look globally, Japanese equities I mean, and earnings and dividend perspective is up there with the S&P 500, something that maybe most people don't appreciate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that for Japan overall, I think it's something really interesting going on in the corporate sector. Then you get to small caps within that. Well, everything I've just said is true for small caps, but then you've got something extra, which is 
it's just so big. It's, there's just this massive universe that you've got a few thousand stocks that are just not covered by anyone. Yeah. And I know that in the investment management industry, we all like to think we're really, really clever and we, we do we find out things that no one else has figured out. Um, but I think intellectually, that's often quite difficult to truly justify. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, in large caps, in any market, there's a lot of really smart people out there competing. Um, I think you can genuinely say with intellectual honesty that when it comes to small caps in Japan, you can find amazing investment opportunities that exist, not just because you're smarter and you figured out something that someone hasn't. It's because no one else has looked at it. it it's, it's intellectually plausible that, you've, that no one's looking. Um, and so I, for me, that's particularly interesting. And what that translates to is um, we find again and again examples of mispricings that sit across all different types of investment styles actually we see lots of interesting value opportunities where we get the opportunity to work with the company to release that value we see mispriced growth lots of growth in the high quality stocks in, in japanese small caps not covered by a single analyst that, that get maybe one or two investor calls a year mm-hmm. so so the it's a stock picker's dream, frankly. It, whatever your style bias, there's there's a ton of opportunity in in this large universe of poorly covered stocks. Mm-hmm. I think um, you've probably seen these charts, as I have from time to time. The number, I think, Japan has the most number of uncovered stocks of any of the major markets globally. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a fantastic opportunity. And mm-hmm. coupled with the tailwind that we have from this um, government-sponsored institutional and corporate change, uh, it makes it a really exciting time. Probably the most exciting in my career, actually. I, th- I think that 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 enthusiasm, that passion, absolutely comes through. And, and it, obviously, we've had conversations over over recent weeks, and uh, yeah, it does seem to be at uh, the beginning of uh, potentially something special. Move, moving on to your fund, the 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 MNG uh, Japan Smaller mm. Companies Fund, the performance over the past six months has been something very very notable, um, to say the least. What mm. what difference does your own investment philosophy and process um, bring to the table in terms of this allocation? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think, um, so I I don't know if I should create a straw man of, you know, what other people do just so that I can knock it down. Because the truth is, I I don't know exactly what other people are doing day to day. I have a rough idea. Um, So I think what I can say is that our portfolio does typically look different from other investors. So we are doing something different. I, I, I can say that, you know, the last couple of decades, you do, you know, get to see what, what your competitors are invested in and what their portfolios look like from time to time. And ours is always consistently different. So, and that's important to me, actually, as an active manager, um, it's important that, that uh, as a KPI, that our portfolio is different because that tells me that actually our process must be different. Um it, it's honestly, if I'm going to be, you know, really strict about this, it's tough for me to know exactly what's different about it. I think um, if I was going to speculate what's different, I think it's partly driven by um, we are very, very stock specific. You know, we don't really start with interesting thematics and ideas. We, we have a dedicated universe of stocks that we've been looking at for 20 years plus, um, and we follow them religiously, even when we're not invested. Mm-hmm. And we just stay very current on the debates and controversies that are affecting those businesses, affecting the industries they invest, that they, they operate in. Um, we stay close to what the competitors are doing and saying, to what the customers are doing and saying. And we're pretty aggressive about really staying at the leading edge of understanding those debates and issues and controversies. And then we wait patiently for opportunities to, to arise for the market to get overexcited or overly pessimistic or to completely miss something. Um, and the idea really in our, in our process is to really try and create serendipity. And when I say that, I mean, uh, you know, that saying success is when preparation meets opportunity. That's really the, the whole point here is that to have the, the most plausible way to systematically generate conviction in an investment process is to be really prepared before an opportunity comes along. Yeah. Um, we can't really predict when opportunities are going to come along so you best best just be prepared <laughs> all the time and 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 the way that we have thought about that is that you can't be prepared for everything so just focus on a, a group of stocks stay current on what the issues are so that when there is an opportunity you're ready to pounce mm-hmm. um the markets typically don't give you long you know it, it, it is it, markets are smart it, it, it it's tough out there to generate value on a consistent basis for clients and i think the 
the most plausible way to try and offer that or to claim to offer that is to put as much preparation before you know prospective opportunities so maybe that's slightly different you know so for us it means that we put research in front of ideas rather than generating smart investment ideas and then trying to do a bunch of research to diligence them we start with diligence here's a group of companies we're going to religiously cover cover them follow them track them understand them as best we can still can't forecast the earnings in the future because no one can but if we can price the risk around those businesses in a superior fashion then i think you know we believe that you can you can consistently outperform so you know that point it sounds like semantic but for us we put research before ideas rather than ideas before research and we found that that has given us superior perspective about the companies we invest in because it means we ask different types of questions mm -hmm. it's also meant that we the idea our ideas come out come from the research mm -hmm. not from the newspapers or from brokers which yeah. tends to lead to a different idea generation engine and a different portfolio mm -hmm. obviously we've, we've touched upon the opportunity set it seems quite clearly defined there your philosophy and your approach is, is quite differentiated, or certainly the, the returns have been, which, which could be alluded to that. So looking at the fund in a, in a kind of granular form, are there any specific opportunities in either uh, you know, sector or, or even stock level that, that you're employing currently within the fund? Yeah, so I would say um, we're not really focused on you know, any sectors per se. Um, we're really looking for just outstanding single stock ideas. Yeah. Um, we're trying to find stocks that are going to go up a lot, mm -hmm. right? The, the, you can go buy an ETF if that's what you want. Um, we're, we're really trying to run a stock picking portfolio where we have a, a collection of, of stocks that we think can very, very meaningfully outperform. Now, we're going to get some wrong, obviously. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about risk control if you like in a minute. But but th that's really what we're trying to do. So rather than approach that from right, this sector's hot, let's go and find something there. We're really trying to find a very specific um, aspect of a business or a company that is misunderstood or, or undiscovered that can lead to highly asymmetric returns. Mm -hmm. So the in terms of getting those really big upside opportunities, I, I just want to add that, you know, we're not looking to take excessive amounts of risk to get that return. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we kind of, we're, we're greedy. We want it all. We want that upside, but really for only modest ownership, risk of ownership. And I think you can get that in small caps. Um, mm -hmm. Again, coming back to this point of them being relatively undiscovered and balance sheets generally being really strong. So, you know, we have been lucky over the years, and I think the opportunity set today is just as rich as historically, if not more so, mm -hmm. been lucky to be able to find these businesses where we think, you know, this stock can double, this stock can triple, mm -hmm. and, the, and actually the underlying risk of ownership is quite modest. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's pretty exciting. But I, I think if I were to try and pin it down a bit more, so rather than talk about a, a sector um, or an idea, um, and my compliance guys will kill me if I talk about a specific stock, but I think I can share that where we have consistently found interesting ideas and we, and we've got a bunch of them in the portfolio today mm -hmm. is in kind of mid and small cap companies in Japan mm -hmm. that are owner managed. Right. So between 20 and 40% owned by the founder. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got a, a, a strong degree of alignment from the beginning. You'll have um, between 20 and 100 years of very consistent track record from the family in terms of, of growing the business and creating value, um, where these companies are just starting to come into a market cap range where global investors start to look at them. Um, and there is one company to have in mind at the moment, for example, where it's got incredibly strong balance sheet, mm -hmm. believe it or not, has 95% global market share in the products that it sells. Wow. Its product has got no substitutes. Um, uh, addresses a growing addressable market in semiconductors. Um, so it's in a very interesting hot space at the moment. Um, and we think is, and as I said, we've got no crystal ball. We don't put too much store in our ability to, mm. to, to forecast, you know, individual data points out, you know, several years in the future, but just looking at consensus expectations for what's going to happen to their customers, businesses, um, it would appear that this company very plausibly could grow earnings 20 to 25 percent per year in the next three years um i'm sure that history will prove me wrong on that but the point is none of that none of that is priced in today yeah. um so that stock today is trading about seven times earnings mm -hmm. and i believe that once it is discovered 
And as I said, it's coming to that market cap range where it's going to start popping up on people's screens. Mm -hmm. That that high quality um, business franchise that's actually run by incredibly thoughtful family with um, uh, with a great deal of care and attention paid to their ESG credentials, I should add. That 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 company will be put in a stock of come in a group or a cohort of of other stocks that currently trade at twenty to twenty five times. So mm -hmm. you know this is a that that's the type of business that we love, where we find we've got good incentive compatibility with with owner with the owner manager, mm -hmm. a great strategy, strong track record of execution, addressing growing M markets, mm -hmm. um, undiscovered and trading at highly discounted valuations. When you put that all together, mm -hmm. along with a strong balance sheet, which gives you margin of safety, that's the that's the scenario where you can get multiples of upside for modest risk of ownership. Yeah. Um, so we do like that kind of owner manager space in, in, in the mid and small caps in Japan. It's a, it, it, there's, there's literally dozens and dozens of them. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, just to wrap up, that's, that seems like that's the opportunity set that, that, that all investors are looking for. And I've no doubt today that pretty much every single viewer of this video will be thinking, I have zero or very small allocation to, to Japanese smaller companies. And if that's the case, and I've no doubt it is, um, you know, th this, you know, this franchise that you're, you're building here at M&G um, ticks all boxes, certainly for myself, for the conversation that we've held over over recent weeks. Um, you know, you're doing something uh, demonstrably different. And uh, personally, I'll say here, full disclosure, I like it. So um, I wish you absolutely all the success in the future. Once again, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, real pleasure uh, talking to you once again. Um, you stay safe and I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.